Yeah, thanks, Sahar. Um, I'm uh, Jeff Rutherford, Director of Research and Development, uh, now at Highwood. It's been almost exactly one year since I uh, since I graduated uh, from Stanford, um, and um, I'm now a Metacore alumni. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of uh, it's it's interesting, kind of strange, giving a uh, giving a talk to Meta from a different uh, from a different desk, um, and uh, I guess that's not just switching uh, sw switching seats from an institution. It's going from an academic, uh, very academic uh, area at Stanford to Highwood, which is. Um, uh, very much more um, industry industry facing. Um, you look at problems a lot differently. Uh, so this is going to be a pretty high level talk. Uh, some of it will probably be um, material will be new to some people. Some of it will be really uh, very familiar, old news um, for some people. But for me, it's trying to uh, put the pieces together and connect the academic way of looking at uh, measurement informed inventories to where really where we're going with uh, regulatory um, and voluntary initiatives. Um, so yeah, I, I called this talk, uh, yeah, the first steps on a long journey, because I think we're really at the start of our um, uh, incorporating uh, measurements um, into, uh, into our inventory approaches. Uh, Measuring methane emissions, um, but we know where we uh, know where we need to go. Um, so yeah, with that being uh, without further ado, I'll get started here. So um, I want to cover a few um, seemingly basic questions. Uh, why, first of all, um, why are we doing this? Why are inventories important? Um, uh, what is uh, a measurement? Uh, a measurement informed inventory. A, a simple but profound question. Um, what is uh, what is reconciliation? Are we talking about the same thing there, or are they different? Um, and then just uh, a quick example at the end of uh, some of the some of the technical technical hurdles that we're uh, that we're talking about. Um, so I've had the I've had the pleasure of uh, working a little bit with um, uh, CD uh, CDPHE um uh, uh Ben Meal uh, around the same time as I transferred from uh um Stanford to Highwood uh transferred from uh EDF working with uh Steph Rucker at CDPHE I think that um Colorado um uh as usual is a is a leader in this space um and uh, I think their journey uh, provides a really good example of why inventories are important and uh how we're starting our long journey to measurement informed inventories um, in 2019, Colorado committed to achieving a 50% reduction in overall emissions by 2030 and a 90% cut uh, by, uh, by 2050. Um, this was a, as a part of setting out their uh, greenhouse gas emissions roadmap. Um, and uh, so it's one, it's one thing to set these targets. Um, what about how do you know that you're uh, actually tracking on them? Um, and as we all know, um, tracking some of these things is a lot harder um, than uh, you might originally think. Um, so first, uh, in 2021, um, Colorado introduced a revision requiring oil and gas operators to submit greenhouse gas intensity plans. Um, and then uh, in, in, in line with that, uh, CDPHE, Department of Public Health and Environment, uh, was tasked with developing plans to check the progress um, of those uh, uh, of those intensity plans, um, specifically for uh, um, oil and gas operators, uh, a greenhouse gas intensity ver verification program um, tied to Colorado's annual emissions reporting program uh, was established and CDPHE was also required to evaluate um, aerial and ground-based survey technologies, and as well as reviewing the uh, effectiveness, availability, and reliability um, of, uh, of those uh, technologies. So that is important and relevant for us because it says two key things. It says that, um, well, Colorado is taking, uh, by in introducing this greenhouse gas emissions roadmap, roadmap, they are taking the inventories very seriously because the inventories um, are what is going to be used to track those prog track the progress. 
Um, second, um, Colorado has recognized that measurement is critical to establishing a credible emissions estimate by introducing this uh, intensity verification program. So for everybody on this call in meta, this is a, this is a big deal. Um, now, how did we get here um, to this place where uh, Colorado regulators are creating this uh, intensity verification program? Um, the meta community, um, this slide will be no news to anybody here. Um, the meta community has been emphasizing the importance of measurement for a long time. So it's really exciting to see this work uh, make it into the regulatory sphere. Um, it's been about a decade coming now, but um, uh, research has uh, pretty much established that um, in many and probably most cases, uh, our bottom up uh, in the traditional bottom up approaches are poor, a poor model for the on the ground reality of methane uh, emissions estimates. Um, I highlight some of the work here, but there are many other examples. Um, uh, this uh, on the left is work by um, uh, my old Stanford colleagues, Yulia Chen, um, Evan Sherwin, um, in their analysis of the uh, uh, Permian Basin, um, highlighting a substantial disagreement um, between the uh, inventories and their uh, best estimate based upon aerial data. Um, but also um, uh, Matt Johnson and Bradley Conrad have done a lot of great work uh, in Western Canada, um, publishing estimates for uh, Alberta and British Columbia. Um, this is based upon collaborations with Bridger. And these are the disagreements are less, but there's still uh, from the from the perspective of a credible greenhouse gas inventory there, um, they're still substantial. Uh, so in general, these updates, these updated estimates are based upon top-down approaches, and we are comparing them with the more traditional bottom-up approaches. Um, top-down approaches leverage uh, technologies that measure um, at the site level, uh, basin level, or regional scale. Um, so you're, it's sort of a trade-off. You're trading off the granularity um, that you're able to achieve with uh, um, the bottom-up estimates with these uh, these capabilities that you're able to achieve from surveying at a higher level and seeing the emissions in a different light. Um, Bottom-up approaches, uh, so, well, top-down approaches, these include uh, aerial remote sensing, space-based remote sensing, um, vehicle-based ba vehicle uh, downwind plume point sensors uh, could also include continuous monitors. Um, the uh, bottom-up approaches that underpin our traditional inventories are generally based upon some direct uh, sampling of sources with uh, high flow samplers or bagging, uh, but this could also include inline, inline flow sensors for measuring emissions uh, uh, flows from pneumatic devices and, uh, and flares. So the key difference, um, and I'm going to uh, pretend I'm Evan Sherwin for a moment here, uh, but the key difference here is that top-down technologies uh, survey more faster. Um, and uh, I would say, for me at least, um, working with Evan, the uh, updated estimates that we're generating are just simply uh, based upon more data. There's obviously a lot more there. There's uh, additional additional nuance, but original emissions factors, um, if you dig into the EPA's inventory, these are um, essentially based upon a handful of measurements that are used to generate the emissions factors. Um, in the 2010s, um, when we uh, uh, we were looking at EDFs, uh, EDF surveys that they were doing with the uh, downwind vehicle-based samplers and uh, Omara's work, uh, Alvar the Alvarez work, these were based upon uh, order hundreds of measurements. Um, and then starting in uh, 20, uh, uh, 2019 and onwards with uh, work from Carbon Mapper um, and estimates generated uh, from uh, by Evan and Yulia and then uh, Matt Johnson's work, these are order thousands of measurements. And in some cases, tens of thousands. And now with uh, Evan's um, distributions paper, we're looking at 1 million measurements. Each time we scale that up, our emissions get higher. Um, so just to kind of uh, 
highlight or put a finer point on this. Um, this is a cumulative uh, distribution function um, from uh, the uh, Permian 2019 uh, distribution in Evan's, uh, in Evan's paper. Um, and just looking at uh, each of these uh, orders of magnitude for, uh, for the uh, emissions rate. So if we're looking at emissions that are higher than 10 kilograms per hour, um, this is about 4% of sites, but that constitute 80, constitutes 85% of your total emissions for this particular distribution. Emissions greater than or equal to 100 kilograms per hour, site level emissions that is, um, we're looking at 0.9% of sites, but 76% of total emissions. Um, if you scale that up even more, 1, 000, emissions greater than or equal to 1,000 kilograms per hour, just 0.1% of sites, but we're still talking about 32% 32 um, 32 of your total emissions. Um, so you can really see, uh, see here what the the magnitude or the um, uh, amount of emissions that you're missing if you aren't sampling, uh, if you aren't sampling enough. Um, and really highlighting that it's really only been in the past few years that we've been able to achieve sampling on the order of thousands. Um, so I think it's, 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 diff, uh, it's important to emphasize that here. Um, and thinking just thinking about the trade-offs that we have between uh, these two different types of measurement or ways of generating inventories top-down approaches versus bottom-up approaches there is a trade-off with top-down approaches you're losing that granularity but um and i think this is uh, uh i remember this from one time i heard evan presenting this material um it's better to be roughly correct than precisely wrong if you're missing one of those large emitters that captures that long tail of the distribution, um, that uh, that will have significant effects on the accuracy of your total emissions estimate. So now I'm going to sort of um, uh, pivot uh, this talk a little bit and talk about how we are applying these estimates into measurement informed inventories via the process of rec reconciliation. So the way I think about reconciliation, um, there isn't really a single, um, there isn't really a single definition in the literature or it really depends where you look. Um, but uh, Thomas has a great blog post on this um, and the way he describes it as the comparison of two or more different emissions estimates and the following investigation into why they, into why they differ. So, the, the work that we presented on the first slides, those are examples of reconciliation. Permian paper is an example of reconciliation. Matt Johnson's work is an example of reconciliation. You're taking your bottom up inventory estimate, you're comparing it to a new estimate based upon site level top down data, and you're looking at why, why they're different and how they're different. Um, this could include digging into the engineering calculations, the emissions factors of your uh, bottom up inventory, it could involve uh, looking at the composition of sources within your site level estimate, or in some cases, as we're seeing with uh, more recent work, looking at supplemental data to better understand the intermittency of these, uh, of these large sources that you're detecting with your site level estimates. Um, now, what I've been spending a lot of time thinking about is how reconciliation is deployed and used under different programs. Um, we're in a space right now where there are, uh, are a lot of different bodies, a lot of different institutions that are thinking about how best to um, voluntarily give operators the opportunity to demonstrate um, low emissions or better emissions performance um, via a number of different programs and also regulatory bodies that are looking at how to enforce this uh, at, a, at a state or country level. Um, I'm going to be uh, rattling off a few different names here, including the uh, uh, Gas Technology Institute's Veritas program, um, the uh, Oil and Gas Methane Partnership, 
um, MIQ, um, but Highwood has an excellent um, voluntary initiatives report that um, I keep open on my desktop as I um, scramble to catch up with uh, Thomas and his team and learn about all these. Um, so part of uh, my sort of journey towards understanding these programs has been to try to understand generally the common aspects that each of them uh, that each of them share. And these aren't a whole lot different from uh, the academic papers, but it's really the details and the motivations um, that differ and we'll get there. Um, but in general, um, I like to think of these in a few uh, sort of simple steps. Um, it really starts with measurement. Measurement is at the core of this. Um, but you know, you know, you might say it's also the hardest part because it it involves, selecting amongst amongst a vast uh, array of technologies that are out there out there right now, each of which has their uh, strengths and their limitations. It involves determining how much you should be surveying, um, when you should be surveying. Um, and uh, and then next, uh, in the step of um, what I call data consolidation and analysis, it's taking those uh, taking those measurements and, uh, organizing them, performing some initial analysis to come up with site level totals um, or event level totals. Um, so each site will probably be covered multiple times. Um, uh, in, with some technologies, sites are going to be covered continuously throughout the year. Um, but from that data, you need to come up with uh, event level magnitudes, um, sometimes event level durations. And then those need to be extrapolated to the entire year. Um, so there's a lot going on there in that step. Next is the reconciliation step. And this is really where um, things start to diverge depending on the program. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about this in the next few slides, but uh, in some cases it's a simple comparison, um, but in others you're, you're appending or you're adding these large emitters to your, to your bottom up inventory. Uh, in some cases, it's replacement of the bottom-up inventory uh, with your uh, uh, with your uh, measured totals, and then also this is yeah this is all sort of overlaid on top of your uh, initial your initial inventory, and then um, depending upon how these programs are constructed, what the overall motivation is, there is uh, decision making that happens on top of your uh, on top of your measurement informed inventory. There's adjustments to it. You're making changes. Um, uh, key point being that this is this is an iterative cycle. We're starting somewhere. Uh, we're starting from the very beginning, and the part of the process and part of the way that these programs are geared towards is is improvement every year start with uh, select a few technologies start using them introduce them introduce them into your inventory and make progress on that uh, make progress on that every year so i'm not going to um uh i don't have the time or the uh, wherewithal right now to go through these in a tremendous amount of detail um but i just wanted to uh, highlight some of the uh, key similarities and differences um, across across each of these programs. Um, I've tried to bundle them into into similar into similar categories, um, and also highlight what data is used in under each of these programs. Um, so, um, starting with the EPA's uh, proposed update to the uh, greenhouse gas reporting program for oil and gas uh, oil and gas systems. Um, what they're doing is a supplemental or additive approach. Um, so the EPA has introduced a new category for uh, other large sources. Um, and this, this category of other large sources is being put on top of the, uh, of the traditional bottom-up inventory. And there's also some changes there in terms of adding new source level um, source level data, but overall this is additive. Um, now, uh, the oil and gas, uh, oil and gas methane partnership um, is a different approach from that. Um, under uh, OGMP 2.0, 
Um, and for those not familiar, this is a, a reporting and mitigation commitment framework um, that uh, close to 153 companies have, uh, or sorry, 150, I think it's around 147, something like that right now, 147 companies have signed on to. Um, this is more of a comparative uh, comparative style framework where uh, the company will come up with a level four inventory um, that is based upon uh, source level mint, uh, source level measurement uh, data and bottom up calculations. And they will validate that level four inventory with, um, uh, with site level data in level five. So um, the way I can, the way I put this together might be a little bit misleading because the level five inventory is still composed of the uh, source level measurement data and bottom up calculations, but it is compared compared to the uh, site level measurement total. Um, and it is uh, it is validated once these two once these two match. Um, so that's the uh, OGMP 2.0 process for uh, reconciliation. Um, MIQ is uh, similar to uh, EPA subpart W in the sense that, um, as they describe it, um, uh, I believe it's unintended, uh, unintended or additional sources are added to your bottom up inventory. Um, if they are considered to be outside of the typical, um, operating or process conditions. Um, so this is another kind of additive style inventory that, that is composed of all different kinds of data, including, uh, the site level emissions and source level measurements and bottom up uh, calculations. Finally, uh, Veritas. Um, Veritas is a standardized methodology. Um, this is not a, a commitment or a certification. Veritas aims to come up with an approach to determine your best estimate of uh, best estimate of true measured emissions. Veritas is probably the closest to the uh, the way that um, reconciliation has been done in some of these um, academic papers, where you're you you take your sample of measurement data and then you use that and you extrapolate that in different ways to best understand your total emissions over the course of the entire year. Um, there are multiple pathways in Veritas where uh, pathway one is measurement only and is strictly comprised of your uh, uh, site level measurement data. Pathway two involves uh, distinguishing sources as either best measured or best calculated and using the measurement data uh, in the categories where the operator deems it to be to be the most appropriate. Um, so yeah, that was a that was sort of a really uh, quick run through of all of the different frameworks, um, but just highlighting uh, how measurement data is used in each of these different cases, how reconciliation um, is conducted, and how some of these are similar and some of them some of them are different. So, uh, like I said at the beginning, we're in uh, we've taken the first steps in a long journey. Um, and there are still um, technical hurdles that need to be uh, that need to be figured out in order for this um, in order for these programs or um, or for reconciliation and measurement informed inventories to uh, to really become successful. Um, so I um, I'm highlighting here a paper that recently came out. Um, uh, lead author, um, lead author Arvind, um, and they highlight a lot of these uh, technical hurdles here in this paper. Um, a few of them being that uh, all of these technologies are currently undergoing rigorous testing. Um, how do we incorporate what we're learning from these testing? Uh, uh, what we're learning from these uh, controlled release tests um, into the measurement informed inventory reports. So how do we improve our understanding of the uncertainty? in measurement informed inventories. Um, and then also uh, based upon the strengths and weaknesses of each of these technologies, how do we uh, leverage multiple of these technologies um, in sort of a multi-tech framework to improve, uh, to improve our best estimates. Um, and then some of these technologies are 
are deployed uh, for only a fraction of the year. So this requires, or in some cases, only a fraction of the sites will be surveyed. How do we properly extrapolate short duration data um, to an annual emissions estimate? Uh, and then finally, um, this is something I've been thinking about. Um, with lit, based upon the nature uh, of these skewed distributions, um, limited sampling will uncover less large emitters compared to more extensive sampling. So it's sort of a situation of the more you sample, the more you pull up the rug, the more you're going to find. Um, and how do you incentivize uh, sampling to the greatest extent possible without, without penalizing people that are uh, that are, you know, um, trying to do the best they can and use measurement technologies the best they can. So these are all these are all difficult problems, not necessarily problems that have been solved, but uh, that we're all working on. So I just wanted to illustrate um, the challenges and where we've gotten with some of these uh, uh, technical hurdles with a really quick example. Um, so here's a here's a situation um, for a hypothetical operator. Um, where they've they've conducted two sampling campaigns using one of the multiple aerial remote sensing technologies. Um, they've performed sampling in the spring. They've performed sampling in the fall. Uh, this is a time series for a single site and a single source category. And in reality, that site source uh, combination has a continuous emissions trace throughout the year. Um, where there'll be uh, sometimes it'll be sometimes there'll be uh, emissions sometimes they there won't but it's a continuous trace. Um, some of these some of that uh, trace is observed by the technology and uh, some of it is not. So how do we um, incorporate this short duration measurement data into our measurement informed inventory? Um, answer is it depends. Um, it depends upon the framework that or what this operator is subject to, be that uh, regulatory programs or voluntary programs that they're participating in. So the first case, um, uh, the first case here would be uh, additive frameworks. Um, and this would include uh, EPA subpart W. Uh, it includes MIQ, both of which I uh, both of which I highlighted um, on the earlier um, on the earlier slide, uh, where the the base of their inventory is the uh, traditional bottom up approach, and what they're doing is they're uh, depending upon conditions and criteria that exist in both of these frameworks. They're adding um, they're adding large emitters. To their inventory. Um, so in the case of MIQ, it's it's relatively uh, relatively non-prescriptive, um, where the operator, um, based upon the uh, the data that they've collected, um, all of the technology that they're deploying, um, they must provide evidence of calculating the rate and evidence of calculating uh, the duration for these large emitters, and depending on if the uh, uh, the emission event is deemed to be uh, unintended or additional to their inventory, they'll add it in. So uh, there's really no requirement for them to look at this period of unobserved, um, uh, period of unobserved emissions. It's simply what technologies have you deployed, what data is available, um, add it to your inventory. Um, in the proposed EPA subpart W, um, uh, we've already talked about the new large, uh, other large release events category. Uh, in this case, the events added are those detected either via quad OB screening or the super emitter response program. And uh, there's details, there's details in there about what constitutes additional um, or other large, uh, other large sources, but that, uh, that includes greater than 100 kilograms per hour, um, 250 metric ton uh, total emission events over the course of the year. So this could, in the case of subpart W, it's not just what you've been observing through your, um, through your screening programs, it could also be uh, public data. So um, did the uh, uh, methane sat is going up soon, did methane sat fly over or did car the new carbon mapper satellite fly over during those unobserved periods? Um, so that's the, uh, 
there are also uh, examples in the literature um, that have demonstrated how multiple technologies uh, can be used under these additive frameworks. Um, so, you know, we've already talked about how um, throughout through your screening campaign or through public uh, data sources, um, you'll you'll capture you'll capture an event, um, you'll detect that event, um, and that'll provide a rate estimate. Um, but you can also uh, implement other data sources to bound the duration, um, to bound the duration of those events, and and basically hone in on the specific period of time uh, where that emitter was occurring, and thus you know come up with a better estimate of the total emissions. Um, that were released uh, for that for that particular event, uh, rather than in the case of uh, EPA subpart W using the default uh, value of 182 days. Uh, so uh, Will Daniels has a has a really nice paper where he looks at using uh, continuous monitoring uh, continuous monitoring data to come up with a, a time bounded uh, duration for these uh, emitter events and um, uh, that being an example of a multi, uh, uh, multi technology framework for emissions reconciliation. So the second set of um, uh, the second set of uh, examples that I'll look at for uh, uh, reconciliation here would be the extrapolation frameworks. Um, so under these extrapolation frameworks, you need to account both for both the measured and the unmeasured, unmeasured sources uh, in coming up with your total annual emissions estimate. Um, because in this case, we're not using the bottom-up inventory as our base for, uh, for our total annual emissions estimate. We are using the measured data to come up, with the, come up with the total. So we're not just looking at additional events, we're looking at the whole thing. Um, and this is, a little, this is a little bit more complicated. Um, so two examples here would be the We've already talked about uh, the Veritas approach, um, where um, there's two pathways. First pathway is measurement only. Second pathway is a hybrid approach, where only the best measured best measured categories um, are used for measurement data. But still, uh, under both pathways, you are extrapolating short duration data sets to come up with your total annual emissions estimate. In OGMP level five, you're required to come up with a site level emissions total that you use to validate your um, source level, uh, level four emissions inventory. So there are um, examples in the literature about how to go about this extrapolation. Um, and uh, these, um, I'm gonna start with the example of a single technology solution. So, um, uh, the uh, uh, Yulia's, uh, Yulia Chen's paper in the Permian, um, Matt Johnson's work, these deal with uh, aerial, aerial remote sensing um, technology solutions for this uh, extrapolation approach. Um, in this, so in this case, the goal and uh, the reason that I'm highlighting these uh, two single observation periods um, is because we don't have most often we will not have aerial data over the course of the entire year. You're gonna have a, a discrete period where um, whoever your vendor is, they go out and sample over the course of several weeks. Um, what you need to do is then extrapolate those to the remainder of the year. You need to say something about what is happening during that unobserved period. Um, so, uh, and uh, Yulia has a very nice appendix in her paper where she talks about how this how you do this, but basically you need to prove that the data that you're collecting during these observed periods provides an unbiased estimate of emissions during the unobserved periods. Um, and there are there is a list of criteria in that appendix or a set of assumptions under which that unbiased assumption is valid. Um, but the key assumption being that your distribution of emissions during those observed periods, and this is a cartoon distribution here, um, that is, that must be the same or within a certain a set of bounds, um, uh, similar to your emissions distribution during over the entire year or during the unobserved period. And the way that they describe that is 
we are assuming that the distribution is stationary uh, across the entire year. Stationary here meaning that diurnal, weekday, weekend, and seasonal trends are um, relatively neg negligible. Um, obviously, the, si the situation is going to be more complicated than this, um, but these are the set of assumptions that we need to make in order to perform this extrapolation. Um, so uh, what about uh, multi-technology deployment and using uh, multiple different types of uh, aerial remote sensing technologies using satellites? Um, can we add satellites in during that unobserved period? Um, what if a uh, carbon mapper happens to have some data on their data portal that we can sprinkle in there? Um, what about using uh, continuous emissions monitors to, um, I mean, if you have if you have one of these technology deployed, they're going to tell you something about the frequency and the duration of your emitters during both the observed and the unobserved periods. Um, I'm thinking about ways that we can that we can do this. Um, still, we're still working on it. I'm sure there's a lot of people that are working on this, but uh, to me, this is the frontier, and this is where uh, this is where we want to this is where we want to go. Is we want to come up with rigorous methods, well documented, um, for how to perform these types of multi technology deployments. So um, I don't have a unfortunately don't have a good citation to put in there right now. Um, there's been, uh, although I would say there, there is some good work uh, published by Erin Talos on this. Um, I, I should have put her, her citation there. But anyways, I think this is, um, to me, this is the frontier for uh, multi-technology deployment and measurement-informed inventories. So that concludes my presentation. Um, I'd say a, a, a plug for Highwood's uh, Voluntary Emissions um, Reduction Initiatives Report. Uh, I also learned how to put uh, QR codes in my slides, um, so please go and download. Um, a few uh, few key points to uh, to highlight um, from this report being, it's been acknowledged. I think um, to me, Colorado, uh, the uh, uh, Colorado um, intensity verification program was pivotal. Um, the updates to subpart W were pivotal. It's it's widely acknowledged. Um, the importance of measurement and accurate, and accurate emissions reporting. Um, this is also uh, reflected in the growing participation in voluntary emission reduction initiatives. Um, and part of this is because top-down technologies have produced a step change in our understanding of methane emissions, but also introduced their own challenges uh, in terms of credible uh, in terms of credible emissions reporting um, and uh, I highlighted some of these in the um, in the technical hurdles that we're facing. Um, we're not going to solve all of these at once. I think these uh, that's why these voluntary initiatives uh, exist right now, and we're all going to be working collaboratively and iteratively um, amongst uh, the operators, technology vendors, regulators, academics, and nonprofits, all of whom are represented on this call. Um, so. Thank you for listening, um, and thank you, Sahar, for uh, introducing me to, or bringing me back to Meta to share some of the stuff that I've been thinking about and working on.